Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our special seminar series, which are prepared for scientists who are about to migrate their scientific research to GMP production. At this juncture, I believe uh, most people will have a lot of questions about their coming facilities adopt and how their investment should be directed. Now, today is the first event of the webinar series. We are very delighted to have Mary Kay Bates as our speaker. So some of you might have already heard her name. Um, she is our senior global cell culture uh, scientist um, based in the States. She has been traveling to our region quite extensively, giving talks to, um, to, to different countries on cell culture applications from time to time. So today her presentation topic is uh, transitioning from cell and gene therapy R&D to GMP compliance. Now, without further ado, please welcome Mary Kay Bates. All right, um, I pass the time to you then. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, thank you for that very nice introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this presentation today. Um, as Jeffrey said, my talk is about transitioning from cell and gene therapy research and development to commercialization and GMP compliance. So that is a very big topic and I can't truly cover it all here. Um, that probably requires several different textbooks, some of which would be out of date by the time they were published. So uh, I'm going to provide more of an overview, um, and kind of a starting point for understanding where to begin um, in transitioning to GMP compliance. So uh, the agenda is, um, it, I'll start with an introduction. I always like to start with defining terms so that we are all starting from the same understanding. Um, so I'll begin with an overview of what is regenerative medicine, and then I will review the growth of regenerative medicine globally. Why are we uh, so interested in this exciting topic? And then I'll turn to my version of what is GMP and why do we have it? And this is really the main part of the talk and where there always seems to be a fair amount of confusion. So once we have that understood and explained, then we can turn to laboratory equipment required for GMP. And here's a sneak preview. You may be surprised that some of the lab equipment that you already know and love can help you on your road to compliance. Then I'll finish up with a summary of my main points for you to remember as you continue on your path to commercialization. So while gene therapy is actually very recent, cell therapy itself has existed for decades, including blood donation, bone marrow and organ transplants, and of course, vaccines, something we're all thinking a lot about today, um, cytokines, antibodies, and other biologics such as insulin. But I think when we think about regenerative medicine, we all think of stem cell therapy, but regenerative medicine is so much more than just stem cell therapy. So um, let's look at the different types of regenerative medicine. Probably the biggest type of regenerative medicine is not stem cell therapy, but other cells, other cell types and tissue engineering. So this can include muscle cell therapy, for example, skin cell therapy, bone therapy and joint replacements. So that's right now the biggest part of the market. Another big part of the market and probably the most exciting part of the market, at least from my perspective, is immunotherapy. And this is a big topic as well. And that includes vaccines and biologics, but also types of immune cells used as therapy. So that would include natural killer cells or NK cells and T cells with all of the potential they bring, and then CAR T cell therapy as a subset of T cell therapy, which is um, being approved in many countries now. And then finally, crossing over all of these types of regenerative medicine is gene therapy because gene therapy might be used in stem cell therapy or non-stem cell therapy or tissue engineering, and it's certainly used in immunotherapy. <clears throat> there are a few different types of immunotherapy. Probably the biggest part of gene therapy is virus engineering. So using viruses to re-engineer uh, cells that we're using as cell therapy to 
get them to express proteins or see things differently the way we want them to do it. And there are also non-viral gene therapies, including CRISPR and transposons and things like that. So um, I guess the point I wanted to make on this slide is just that there's so many different types of regenerative medicine. And I'm sure all of you are thinking about one or more of these types all, already. Now, I also find that a lot of people think about cancer applications when they think about cell and gene therapy, and there are a lot of them, but I wanna make the point that there are actually many applications in cell and gene therapy. So nearly every human disease or dysfunction that you can think of is a target for cell and gene therapy. And so that's really exciting because again, there are a lot of potential treatments now for diseases and dysfunctions that previously didn't have a good therapy. So with that understanding of regenerative, regenerative medicine and the vast array of applications, let's look at the market size and growth of these applications. So all areas of regenerative medicine are projected to have strong growth over the next five years, especially cell therapies. And those are projected to grow with a cumulative annual growth rate of almost 27%. Somewhat surprisingly, stem cell therapies separated out from other cell therapies like immunotherapy are projected to have the slowest growth, but still almost 9% growth. And if we break regenerative medicines into applications, musculoskeletal applications will remain the largest application, just as I showed on the slide with the, with the colored circles. But as we know, oncology applications will have the largest growth with a cumulative annual growth rate of almost 24%. But all of these applications will show double digit growth. So it's very exciting um, and there's a lot of potential in this market. So hopefully this, ta this talk gets you a little bit along your road as well. And if, if we look at the growth of regenerative medicine institutions across the world, North America has the largest number of re regenerative medicine institutions currently, but if we look at Asia, uh, there are 184 such institutes, and I can tell you that a year ago, this number was only 166. So there is a lot of development in this region, and the countries of Oceania are making their contributions as well. So let's look at the types of institutions where this growth is occurring. I think when we think about regenerative medicine and cell therapy, we think about the big pharmaceutical companies like Lanza, Takeda, Pfizer, but these large global corporations are only 8% of the total. So 23% of this pie are academic and nonprofit institutes and the rest, 64% is shown in the blue and the red are companies with less than 100 employees, and these are startup companies, and these are the majority of the market. So this is where the growth is occurring, but also where the innovation is occurring. And this is where a discovery at a university or a hospital or a government lab begins the road to an improved therapy, and maybe that's where some of you are coming from. So what is driving this growth? Well, first, global populations are experiencing more disease including not just respiratory viruses like our current virus and our current pandemic, but cancers, diabetes, heart disease, and more. So there's a need for more and better treatments. Next, collaboration. Large established companies are partnering with the small startup companies because that's where the innovation is, as I said earlier. And this is to the advantage of both sides because the large company can offer infrastructure and capability while gaining access to that startup company's innovation. Also, academics and government institutions are partnering with in industry in ways they didn't in the previous century. And so this is very exciting. Also, there's more funding available as investors look at the potential growth in these companies and applications. And finally, and very importantly, government regulatory bodies across the world are working to create harmony in regulations so that companies can work towards similar standards across regions and so that more therapies are gaining approval more quickly. 
So that's all good news. Well, except for diseases increasing globally. All right, so with all of that excitement, now let's turn to talking about GMP. So with this part of the talk, I want to, as I said at the beginning, take a step back and look at, at what is different as you transition from an academic research lab to GMP and why do we have GMP? So if we look at the big picture, in academic research, the goal is knowledge. You are studying a system to learn more about it. And along the way, you may discover something interesting that you can develop as a patentable invention or as your own intellectual property. But in industry, working under GMP, the goal here is to produce a product such as a therapeutic treatment, a drug, a method, or a process. And this goal requires a lot more safeguards because your goal is something to improve human health. So it's not about the education or discovery. So the somewhat laid back approach to lab work simply doesn't work for production of something to be used for human health. And so that brings me to the definition of GMP or good manufacturing practices. So the goal of GMP is to ensure that, that a product is safe and pure, that product is effective, and that product is of high quality. So this is the whole point or purpose of GMP, safety, efficacy, and quality. Now, good manufacturing practices are not detailed step-by-step -step requirements. Instead, they lay out minimum requirements that must be met by a manufacturer. So importantly, you have to understand that GMP standards are guidelines only. There are many ways to comply and that's because each company process or product is different. So the way to meet GMP is through an effective quality management system. So how can we better understand what this is all about? I want to put this in terms of a big concern for regenerative medicine, and that is contamination. So as an example of why we have GMP guidelines, let's think about cell culture contamination. You're probably already familiar with the different types of microorganisms that cause contamination, including viruses, bacteria, and fungi. But contamination can also be caused by cross-contamination of other cultured cells introduced by accident when working with more than one cell type at a time. <clears throat> and another type of contamination that's a risk for cell therapies is non-viable particulates introduced into the culture by accident through the air or through handling. These are divided into inherent, intrinsic, and extrinsic particles, par particulates, depending on where, what the source is of those particulates. And they can pose a risk to uh, the end product. So finally, the last type of cell culture contamination that I'll talk about is toxicity caused by volatile organic compounds, including laboratory cleaners and disinfectants and chemicals used in molecular biology and biochemistry applications. So all of these types of contamination can have deleterious effects on cultured cells or pose a risk to quality of a product. And if such contamination were to occur for cells used in a therapy, the product could not be used. So the therapy could not be applied to a human patient. And I can talk for a long time about contamination and those effects on cultured cells, but that's a different talk altogether. So let's stick with um, what's concerning for some working under GMP. So if I just look at microbial contamination, in the case of microbial contamination, that's the most common type of contamination, these microorganisms come from us. They are normal flora from every part of our body, and we all carry on average 10,000 microorganisms per square centimeter on our skin. And microorganisms also come from the air around us. Some of the microorganisms in the air have come from our normal flora, and much of it is free living microorganisms. But normal indoor room air contains between 30 and 1,000 microorganisms per cubic meter. So that's a lot of microbes all around us. But how do those microorganisms get into cell cultures? 
So I want to tell you a little story about how contamination occurs. And so this graph, um, I'm going to tell you a little story that goes with this graph. And what we're what we're graphing here is the quality or the percent of what I'm measuring on the y-axis, and the x-axis is the time over the course of one year. And so if I think back to my academic career, um, if I think about this graph in terms of I'm just starting a project, it's the beginning of the semester, and I'm very excited. This is going to, this, this project is going to get me a great publication. And so if I think about the quality of my technique as I'm working with my cultured cells, my aseptic technique quality is nearly perfect. As you can see, it's nearly 100%. And I mentioned it's the start of a semester, so we have a new student working in the lab, and it is his first lab job. His name is Mike, uh, and so he's very careful about all of the cleaning that he's doing for us. And so as a result, graphed in the blue line at the bottom of the graph here, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of circulating contamination in the laboratory is very low. The, the laboratory is very clean. So now time goes on. And a friend of mine comes in to talk to me while I'm working with my cells in the BSC. And she tells me a funny story about a guy down the hall. And I start laughing and I accidentally touch my pipette tip to the outside of my growth media bottle. But, so I made a mistake and you can see here, it's a lapse in my technique. But I realized this, that I made this mistake. I discard my pipette tip and my quality of my technique goes back to very good. Meanwhile, it's uh, several weeks into the semester and our student Mike is taking a bunch of exams. And so uh, he skips some time in the laboratory and you can see we have a temporary buildup of dust and dirt in the laboratory. Uh, but he does well on his exams and he comes back and starts doing a good job again. And now time goes on. Uh, I've had to repeat experiments. They aren't going as well as I had hoped. I'm not getting the results that I expected. So I'm having to do some troubleshooting. And at the same time, my principal investigator has loaded another project on my plate. Um, so I'm starting to skip steps. And Mike is figuring out that working in the laboratory is not as exciting as he thought it would be, that cleaning lab equipment is not quite the, quite the basic research he thought he would be doing. And he is starting to skip steps. And now these trends continue uh, where I'm, you know, both of us are skipping steps and eventually there's so much dust and dirt built up in the laboratory and I am, I have, the quality of my technique has gone so far downhill that these two lines cross and that's when you get a contamination. And so then what happens? Well, I realize that I, it's not working for me to skip those steps. I, I know that I have to be careful and do all the things that I know I'm supposed to do. And I have a little talk with Mike about how critical it is that he do a good job of cleaning the laboratory to reduce the circulating contamination in the air. And so you see the cycle begins again. And so I hope that story helps to explain why we implement GMP. Good manufacturing practices are designed to produce a product that is safe and pure, that is effective, and that is of high quality. So to achieve such a product, I think you can see, based on the story I just shared, that we need GMP to reduce human variation in a system or a task performed by humans. Humans are not machines, so we need to reduce the inherent variation that comes with being human. We need to ensure that each task happens exactly the same way each time to protect patients and to ensure that the product is safe, pure, is effective and of high quality. So to, to achieve this goal, we use GMP and GMP is, def is designed to define practices and protocols with clearly established procedures that are repeated exactly the same way each time. And if there are any changes to clearly explain what was changed and why and when such a change occurred. So detailed training is important to ensure that procedures are performed the exact same way by everyone. And periodic refresher training is critical as well. It's not a matter of learn it and forget it. 
But as my story about contamination shows, we all need reminders to keep our skills and procedures from slipping over time. Another part of GMP is to document all the steps as they happen. This is a very important part of GMP. It's not like in an academic lab where you can make a note on a paper towel and transfer that paper towel to your laboratory notebook later. In GMP, the exact procedure must be followed and noted, including the name of the person performing the task, the date, the lot number, and the results. And these are simply minimum requirements. Finally, GMP is about main detail. So the goal is that anyone can look at these records and understand easily exactly what happened and how. But it's also about why something was done. So everything has a reason and such reasons must be reported. And finally, such records must include indexes so that they are easily searchable when you want to find something. And so that was just an overview. And here's a bit more about the key GMP principles as explained by the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers. First, as I've said, GMP means step-by-step -step procedures and instructions. These must be carefully followed to prevent contamination, mix-ups, accidents, and to ensure quality. Third, documentation must happen as it occurs to ensure compliance and traceability. Number four, GMP exists to validate a system is doing exactly what it is designed to do, behaving in the way it should, producing the quality product. And number five, GMP also applies to the way facilities and equipment are designed. And number six, how those facilities and equipments are maintained. Number seven, I already mentioned training that it should be clearly defined and refreshed periodically for everyone. And number eight, as we discussed, GMP is there to prevent contamination. The ninth principle is about quality of the final product, including proper controls of product and procedures, validation, purchasing supplies, labeling, and testing. And finally, the scariest part is number 10, the periodic audits. So all of these key GMP principles guide how each manufacturer implements procedures and controls so that they can pass audits and ensure compliance. And so with this explanation of these key GMP principles, you may be thinking, yes, sure, that's helpful, but how do I comply? How do I do this in my own company or my own laboratory? Well, that's just the question that everyone asks. And the answer is that it's up to each company to create their own GMP system to create procedures and records that are built on these basic principles. Because as you have seen, the GMP principles are only guidelines. Why are they only guidelines? It's because each institution, company, laboratory, each of them is different. You have different people, processes, you have different methods, training, different equipment, facilities, even your documents will be different because in the end, your product is unique. That's why you're going to scale up and produce it. And the main reason to create your own GMP system is that you know your systems like no one else outside your institution possibly could. You can build on that knowledge, that experience, to work within these principles to ensure that your product is safe and pure, is effective, and is of high quality. Now, there is good news. There are some important ways that laboratory equipment can help you along the way. So for regenerative medicine, your lab equipment is the center of your production process and your equipment must be your partner in GMP. So your equipment must meet the performance needs for producing a cell product that meets the requirements for viability and for quality. So the equipment must perform in a manner that is reliable and that is repeatable to minimize lot to lot variation. If it's an incubator or a freezer, you should expect fast recovery to set conditions after every door opening and uniformity throughout 
so that cells grow the same or freeze at the same rate regardless of where they are inside that chamber. You should expect clear documentation with your equipment that includes a list of specifications and materials that shows you how this equipment will perform. And you should clearly understand how to maintain and to control your equipment. And your equipment should be easy to use. For training and for use, everyone should be able to understand proper operation. The equipment should be easy to clean. It is amazing to me how often lab equipment is difficult to clean. So in addition to that, you should be able to monitor at a glance the conditions and you should expect that equipment to have onboard data logging. And guess what? All of these needs may already be met by the equipment you already use. So to finish up my talk, let me just show you a little bit about these expectations of lab equipment and what you should look for. As we've discussed, GMP is about safety, purity, efficacy, and quality. All of these things depend on your lab and your equipment being clean. So you should expect your lab equipment to provide clear recommended procedures for cleaning and disinfection, what, disinfections are, what disinfectants are recommended and compatible, you should expect a list of materials included in that equipment and such information is, is there to aid your cleaning and disinfection practice, practices and to control contamination. If the equipment is compatible, compatible with vaporized hydrogen peroxide processes for disinfection, you should find clear documentation of that and the controls for the equipment should be able to be used with gloves. So the United States Food and Drug Administration came out just recently with new guidances for COVID regarding cleaning, disinfection, and gloves. So all of these things are very relevant for your lab equipment. I mentioned a list of materials included in laboratory equipment. Here's one example, a list for one of our CO2 incubators showing that it contains stainless steel, glass, silicone, and so on. And here is a list of compatible disinfectants and what to avoid. So I mentioned vaporized hydrogen peroxide, which is increasingly used in clean rooms. Um, usually that's performed by a trained technician. Uh, varies, varied concentrations of hydrogen peroxide depending on the manufacturer, but at least 35%. Um, we do not recommend wet VHP procedures because that can cause corrosion of, of the equipment. So we recommend only dry or non-condensing VHP processes. Um, and because that, that provides better equipment tolerance and compatibility with the process and, and less damage to the equipment. Um, also, you should look for a provider that ensures they provide tests to perform, they will provide tests that will confirm elimination or neutralization of the chemical and also elimination of the microorganisms. In other words, proving that it's effective. So what else should you consider in thinking about lab equipment for your GMP processes? Well, what about maintenance and qualification of that equipment? How do you install the equipment and what do you need for installation? How is the qualification for installation, operation, and performance, including temperature mapping, how is that performed? Is there someone trained on this equipment to help? How do you check or how do you change calibration? How do the alarms work and can you modify them? What's best practice for using this equipment? What should you know or expect to do for routine maintenance? What about replacement parts? What parts are, are provided by the manufacturer? If you need manufacturer support, would it be available when you need it? So these are all things to consider. And when thinking about performance, remember that it's more than just a list of specifications. So if you're looking at an incubator, for example, it's not just about what's the accuracy of the sensors, but how do those sensors perform in real life? What is the recovery after a door opening? Or what is the uniformity in that incubator, uh, meaning 
you know, what's the deviation in temperature from the top shelf to the bottom shelf, for example. So you should be able to have these sorts of data as well. So last but not least, your lab equipment comes with documentation, but not all lab equipment comes with the same documentation. So ask for documents that show you that the features in that equipment were tested, ideally by a separate group, a third party, to validate the performance of the, that laboratory equipment. Is the user manual understandable to you and easy to follow? Can you get factory acceptance test documentation and lists of parts, drawings of how big it is and what clearances you need? What other certifications are available for this equipment that will help if you are audited by a regulatory agency? Here's an example of factory acceptance test documentation, um, but you can also look for uh, a certificate of conformance, which confirms the, that equipment was tested, uh, serial number traceability, uh, end of line testing. Um, you should have all of these things in a, in a factory te acceptance test documentation, and not all equipment will provide that. So um, it, you, you have to look very carefully at these things too, because as I said, uh, a lot of this information and these certificates may not be available from all manufacturers. Okay, so that's the body of my talk. I'll just finish up with a summary of my main points and some conclusions. So early on in the talk, I discussed how regenerative medicine applications are projected to show double digit growth through the next five years. So that's very exciting. And I think that's why we're all here today. We talked about good manufacturing practices and that GMP is designed to ensure safety and purity, efficacy and quality. And in practice, GMP is there to eliminate human variation and processes over time, to eliminate that human tendency to skip steps and to be less, um, defined as you go through a process. So GMP eliminates that human variation. And GMP defines practices and procedures. It defines, it also requires documentation and good record management. You yourself can create a robust GMP system by following the basic principles and by building on the knowledge that you already have of your processes and your, and your personnel and your procedures. Finally, your lab equipment should be your partner in that journey to GMP compliance. Your lab equipment should provide you information on the performance. It should provide you clear documentation. It should be easy to use and it should provide readily available support. So we have introduced our new cell therapy systems laboratory equipment. This included, includes the most needed products for regenerative medicine with a documentation package that contains everything you need to start off your GMP work, including equipment drawings, specifications, performance documentation, factory acceptance, test data, and more. Importantly, this line of products offers compliance services with factory trained field support personnel who are trained in installation and qualification, operation qualification, and performance qualification validation. These people know our equipment literally inside and out, and they have all of the answers for how to qualify our equipment for your processes. At Thermo Fisher Scientific, we are committed to scientific advancement, and we offer products and solutions to enable our customers, that's you, to push the boundaries of innovation with our focus on you, our customer, and our unmatched Portfolio of products for regenerative medicine and industry leading scale and depth of capabilities are there to work with you. Thank you very much for your attention today. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the talk and um, I guess that's all I have. Thank you, Mary Kate, for your, for your talk. Um, I think like me, I hope all of you uh, find it uh, very useful and uh, informative. Now, uh, please take note that this webinar series is all together made up of uh, eight different talks covering uh, different topics from uh, factory audit preparation, 
data management, how to preserve your sample integrity by cryogenic uh, preparation, um, how to select uh, key equipment like biosafety carbonate, centrifuge, um, and particularly those that are used in the downstream bioprocess harvesting. Now, I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk today very much. Um, please stay tuned and you will receive uh, the event invitation from our colleagues uh, very soon. So have a good day. Goodbye all. Thank you and bye-bye.